So we see that the methanol, the e-methanol option is the absolutely obvious option for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And, and within the, the container segment, cruise ship segment, and also in more local type shipping. And that is way more than we can ever handle. So we're very happy with that segment and, and we will be busy working in that segment for the next 30, 40, 50 years. So the shipping sector has about 100,000 ships, give or take a few, on a global basis. It emits about 3% or so of all the CO2 in the world, but it is actually about 15 to 18% of all the transportation emissions in the world. So it's, it's a big, big emitter. So the shipping sector has to do something, and the shipping sector is of course not just one sector. It's the container ships, it's the ferries and row rowers, it's the cruise ships, it's the it's the uh, oil tankers, it's the bulkers, all these stuff. And these are on different, I would say, different, differently advanced in terms of how much they want to do. And the container guys are definitely in the lead. Container guys and, and cruise ferry guys are in the lead. The other guys are going to come to the party, I think, a little bit later. But they now have a couple of choices. And, and the choice that we all know that has been around for a while is LNG which is somewhat carbon reduced, but it's definitely not carbon free. They have e-methanol, which is coming along very strongly. I think we are about 300 ships on order now on dual fuel e-methanol. So you can run on, on either fuel, but you can definitely run it on the methanol. And the next one that is a lot of talk about is ammonia, where I think there might be one ship existing today full stop. The others, the engine manufacturers are trying to get their engines fixed for ammonia as well. So I think that will also come for certain long haul routes, that ammonia will be another option. Then there's a bit of biofuel that comes from kind of the land base that you can sort of put in the ship, but all of the, the bios fuel versions will be just sort of relatively small in comparison for the enormous volumes that we need in the shipping space. When we went through the previous sort of fuel age, we started pulling molecules out of the ground and we pulled them up quicker and quicker and quicker. And we built ships and trains and whatever to, to run on them right now. That day is over. We're not gonna pull things out of the ground any longer and, and burn it. Now we're gonna actually produce the electron and then produce the molecule and then burn it, which means we have a whole lot more work to do before we get to that molecule. And so now anything, anyone who can help out is going to be available. Right? It's, it's really the all hands on deck. Who, who can supply a little bit of something that can go into we need, what we need to, to fuel the economy? And that's why it's, 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 it's no chance that there's going to be one fuel. There's going to be all the fuels we can because all of them has to be produced. And, and you don't produce different molecules in the same machines. It's not you could just shift over and say, we're going to do this molecule instead, which would have been nice if you could. But yeah, so all the production capacity we can muscle up, we will need. All the renewable energy generation that we can put together, we will need. Because the, the, the fuels that we have been consuming have been so many, and the, the source has been so cheap and easy to deal with, and that game is over. Now we have to do it ourselves. We're going to survive for the next 500 years. We have to reuse the energy that comes onto the to the surface of the of the planet and make that into fuel the low emission fuel is in my mind electrofuel or or various types of, of ptx fuel and and for them the the obvious one is of course can we make hydrogen cheaper and guess what I know a company sitting right across who is doing that and they have a, a unique tool to do that and, and we'll, we'll have that one come out sooner, sooner I hope, rather than later. And, and many others that we work with have that as well. So hydrogen production at a low cost is of course a, a key, key piece. But then it's also all the, the conversions from that hydrogen to something else, so that's the power to or the H2, the, the X, whatever the X is, that, that is needed as well. And, and that's where, where catalysts in different ways and shapes and forms and, and, and processing is, is required in a huge way. But it's all about going from 
electrons to molecules in the lowest cost way. And whoever can do that best, cheapest, fastest is, is, is the one who's going to have a lot of work to do. And there's going to be a lot of space for a lot of companies to do that because the entire world needs to go there. So it's just enormously big. Like we say, we're going to build 500 plants. Now that's a lot of tops of equipment in 500 plants, but there's, that's, that's going to give us maybe 10% of the, of the liquid fuel market in the shipping space. So it's, it's just the, the transition and the, 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 the change that needs to come is, is so phenomenally large that there's enough for everyone, everyone, everyone who wants to be in this game and play. The demand for electrofuel or for e-methanol, if the companies that have ordered the ships on methanol come, I mean, both when the ships arrive and they decide to buy methanol, we're talking about 10, 20 million tons on an annual basis already. The capacity available, so the supply in 2025 might be two to 300,000 tons. So 300,000 to 20 million. So we have a long way to go. Us, us that produce the fuel have, have just an huge, a huge volume we need to fill up. So the question is if there's any inhibitors to e-methanol and why it's not adopted. The answer is no. There are no inhibitors. It's, it's all very doable. The engines exist. The ships are being built. The bunkering capabilities are standard from, from from uh, liquid fuel. Uh, we might need tank capacity. It's a matter of coating tanks in some parts and, and getting sort of approval from the local port authority. But port authority. But there's absolutely nothing stopping us from rolling this thing out in the millions of tons of fuel now. So we can do it. The world is ready. Let's get, let's get going. The, the big issue we have in front of us now is that everybody needs to convert at the same time. Because if you don't convert and I don't convert at the same time, either I or you will have a price point that is significantly different and therefore the market will be out of whack. So somehow we need to boil the whole ocean at the same time and that's not so easy. So we need to figure out how we do that. And, and that, in, in my mind, is the biggest challenge. Everybody is, of course, everybody within a certain segment, within a certain geography that competes with each other. So it doesn't have to mean the whole shipping industry. But if you have three ferry companies in the same route or on the same route or similar route, they need to do it at the same time. So everybody gets the, the new price level and then it's all OK. It's like we, we know very well. After COVID, we can suddenly pay twice as much of our, for our flights, and it's okay because there's no other alternative. And, and the same thing goes for, for other things. As long as the entire market, no, I should say as, as our segment in the market that we relate to, as long as that one moves up or down at the same time, everybody's fine. It doesn't sort of change things. And, and I think for us to move these alternative fuels in, we, we cannot... I mean, the market is not going to be any different. There's going to be ships there in the future as well. So it's a matter of, 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 of coming in sort of together in a way that we can balance each other. And there was an interesting picture I saw from COP the other day where they had lined up all the CEOs of all the container ship companies of, of a significant size. And I said, okay, this is cool. So they're actually figuring out now what, what they need to do. That's what I'm hoping anyway. <laughs> so they can bring in a, another level of, of cost on their fuel and still everybody's going to be sort of okay and survive. It will happen either in five years or in 25 years. Now, do you want to get in and be part of it and make it happen in five and tell your kids and grandkids that you made a difference? Or are you going to sit back and wait for 25? Because we can all do that. And then it will just be more uncomfortable when we get to that point. And I think for all of those who sit there with that opportunity, it's just such a phenomenal chance in in your life to make a difference and go first have the guts sort of jump in and i think we've seen in our business like the from 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 our first angel investor almost our first crowdfunder that people said i'm stepping in because i believe 
I don't need numbers. I don't need anything else. I just know this is the right thing to do. And those are the people that made the difference for us. I mean, where we could move forward. I mean, when, when Topsa and, and I talk about Lars Storm says, yeah, we're stepping in because we believe in you. It, it wasn't because of numbers. I mean, he didn't have a clue if we were going to succeed or not. But at some point, people have to step in. And there are always those, I call them front runners, that at least I hope to inspire, that, that dare to go in the front. And, and somebody's going to go in the front. And whether it's Bill Gates that we talk about, or it's, it's sort of angel investor number three, who says, I really believe in what you're doing. It, it doesn't matter, but we need them. We need them and we need them all to start because we cannot just sit and wait for each other forever because then it's not going to happen. So Liquid Wind is an electric fuel developer. That means that we work in the market to find suitable locations where we can place facilities that will produce electric fuel once all the development work is done. And an electric fuel for us is methanol, and methanol is made from CO2 and hydrogen. And the combination of those two gives us a liquid, which is methanol. And once we've removed the water from that, we have the, the pure electric fuel that is our end product. As a developer, we do all what is required from finding what we call a host, so a source where we can be, where we can access the, the raw material CO2, all the way to selling the fuel so that once everything is done. And, and in the meantime, we also find ourselves an investor who, once the development has been done, also invests and, and actually builds the facility. So the way we've looked at it is that it's important to find locations where you have the raw material readily available. And we focus number one on the CO2, the biogenic CO2. So we go to places where we can access biogenic CO2. We do that in CHP plants, we do that in pulp mills, we can do it in ethanol plants. A lot of those plants are easy to find in the Nordics. So that's where our focus is. If you can combine that with power that is relatively inexpensive and that's renewable power that is inexpensive, well, then you have, of course, a, a, an even better place to go. And it happens to be so that in northern Sweden, northern Finland as well, we have relatively inexpensive renewable power. And then the third thing which is helpful is to have the logistics covered. So you're actually on the water by a port and we happen to have that as well. So there are a number of good locations in Sweden, Finland that we have identified that we want to build facilities at. But, but that's how we've looked at it. Now, you can look at that in a similar way and go to Canada, either Eastern Canada or, or Western Canada, but there, there's, the CO2 is there, the power is there, the ports are there. You can also do it in, in, in uh, Latin America. Brazil is, is a very good place. There's a lot of good opportunities there. Or you might go to Southern Spain where there are other opportunities. And, and those are kind of the palette of the, the locations that we think are the easiest to deal with. Then there's Australia and there's, there's Middle East and so on, but then you get into more of the ammonia business because you wouldn't get the CO2 access as easily there. When, when we started off, we knew that we needed the entire value chain to make liquid electrofuel together, or we needed to make them work together for it to work. And, and we had set ourselves out to find the best player along that value chain and, and make that into a team. So we started, it was actually in 2019, we had speed dating with all the different potential companies. So we actually had about 15 companies in three different value chains and they, they bid against each other. And then we chose one, one of the, the value chains to be our partners. Now, since then, we have continued to work very, very closely together. And we have said clearly and openly that we are not changing suppliers. We don't go to bid and sort of go for the lowest bidder. We work together with the same partner again and again and again. And we've really stuck to that. And, and TOPS has been one of those core four partners that we have. Liquid Wind has worked together with TOPS since about 2008. 18, I'm guessing. They were one of the first strategic partners that we uh, connected with 
and, and we had some fantastic discussions with Lars Storm back in the day, who, after interviewing and grilling me for a, for a couple of meetings, says, well, okay, those guys, they might be okay. We, we may consider working with them. And so from 20, I think 18, that was the case that we kind of said, yeah, this makes sense. And then we carried on yeah, ever since then, 2019, to do early, early phase of, of engineering together. And then in 2020, uh, Tops actually invested into Liquid Wind, which was then the first strategic investor to put money into our company. So we were like thrilled and excited that Tops had the guts and the vision to go first. I found in the last couple of months, we are doing a big fundraising. And in that fundraising, I get asked by all this sort of hard-nosed investor, how can you know that you have the right partner if you've already told them you're going to work with them and now you're trying to get a good deal from them? And I say, I can't. I can't know that I'm getting the best deal, but I know that the partners I have, I fully trust them and they want to work together with me and I want to work together with them. And I am hopeful, maybe silly, but I'm hopeful that by, by trusting each other so much, they will get better and they will get better at serving us and, and collectively we, we do something that has not been done before. And I think we've kind of proven in the last couple of even just weeks that, that other people are acknowledging and, and appreciating what we're doing as well. I think the hope is that we're, we keep on trying every day. I try, you try, uh, the, new, the new startup somewhere tries, the big, the big container ship guys try. We, we all try to make it a little bit better every day. And then we have some people that believe more. We have those front runners that we talk about. And, and as long as they keep on trying and as long as they get fuel to try with or, or are fed sort of the ability to continue to try, we will succeed. And, and as, a, as a humanity, we've done it before. I mean, this is just another challenge. We've had challenges before. We believe the world will go down many times before, but, but we can do it. And when the, when the pain or the fears is strong enough, we will, we will get through. I have no doubts about it. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful future. There's lots to be done, but, but we have a lot of clever people working together to make it happen.